Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you're here today. Um, I'm so glad that some of you had some friends. I talked to Megan Keyswetter outside, and she said she's so glad she got her Christmas bonus. She was able to pay some of her friends to come with her today. So, uh, um, and they said, don't use that word friend so much. You know, kind of acquaintance would be better. I do got to open up with a little story today that I thought was interesting. Last week, we came in here to practice our music for the IF gathering. And then I went home, and they were still around here, and Ann... Church. And I said, well, I said, uh, you know, I'll go tomorrow and check it out. And she said, oh, it's in here. I said, are you sure? It's, yeah, it's a bat. And she took a picture of it and sent me a picture of this bat. I've got the picture on my phone of this bat. Oh, it's a big bat. And so I get some guys, and we come in here Thursday night or Friday night, we come in here at 9 o'clock at night, and we've got night vision goggles, and we've got some uh, ammunition to get rid of a bat, and I've got my boys crawling around underneath the overhang, and we're going everywhere. And, and Gary Bikeman, you know, big Gary, we're looking everywhere for this thing. 
And then I blow up the picture, and it's an eye hook. It's in the back of the ceiling back there. That's all a big old black eye. And I said, Ann, are you sure you saw a bat? And she said, I saw a bat. Now, the picture may not be a bat, but I saw a bat. And I said, you know, you're a grandma now. <laughs> and, and, you know, and sometimes when you get older, you get on medication. And sometimes the medications make you see things. So uh, we've got a, a special thing for you today. Today is a wonderful day. Be ready for God to move. Amen? God's going to move today. All right. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Almighty God, as we are gathered at this time, I thank you so much to see a church full of people who want to serve you. And Father, today we ask that you move in a mighty way today, that if there's someone here that is battling anything, that when we leave here we realize that because of the battle we have victory and we have assured victory in Jesus. And Father, we pray that when people leave today, they leave mighty warriors being willing to defend their faith and to reach out to a lost world for you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And all of God, Sherlin said? Amen. All right. Good morning, church. We're so glad you could join us this morning for worship, whether you're here or watching from home. Uh, we're just blessed to have you here. So let's stand and let's sing to our God.
grace. We thank you that you are the giver of all good things and you have given to us even when we don't deserve it. Uh, Father, we pray that you would fill us today with your message, uh, with songs, with hope, uh, that we might be filled so we can give to others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, you're still Thou hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was renamed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me.
release from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began For oh, your grace so She's over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with a freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested. testament to God's love for us right there. Um, <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Samuel Field, and Manhattan Christian College holds a special place in my heart. Um, I got my teaching degree from Kansas State, but I got my Bible and leadership degree from Manhattan Christian College, so I was really excited to hear that Manhattan Christian College was here and representing um, the college to talk to you today, and I was even more excited to hear that my cousin Ben is going to be the one speaking. So I get to see my cousin, and he gets to tell you all about, all about Manhattan Christian College. So let's give a welcome to Ben Field, everybody. He was 13 years old and weighed about 85 pounds soaking wet. Grew up in a broken home. Divorce had affected his family when he was a little boy. And someone invited him to church. And through his youth group, he ended up becoming a Christian and following Jesus. When it came time for college, he ended up at Manhattan Christian College. And today, he's in his early 30s, and he's planning a church in New York City. And I think that story is an unbelievable example of the partnership that Manhattan Christian College has with, with Christian churches. Because without the church... 
I'm not sure if my friend Russell ever comes to know Jesus. And without Manhattan Christian College, I'm not sure if he's planting a church in New York City today. Manhattan Christian College exists to educate, equip, and enrich Christian leaders. And so what we're doing at MCC is we are raising up young people who are going to make a difference for Jesus Christ with their life. We're raising up young people to be preachers, worship leaders, missionaries. And through our dual degree program with Kansas State University, uh, we're raising up people who end up becoming teachers and engineers. But for us at Manhattan Christian College, we don't view somebody as a teacher. You're a missionary who happens to teach. At Manhattan Christian College, we don't view people as engineers, but you're a missionary who happens to be in the engineering field. That's our philosophy of education. Uh, that's what excites us, seeing young people who want to use their lives for God's kingdom. Thank you, Norton Christian Church, for your partnership with Manhattan Christian College. It means a lot to the college, and i got to tell you, it means a lot to me personally. Uh, my dad grew up in this church, Gene, some of you may know him. My grandpa Julius and my grandma Alice were faithful members for years. Thank you. I love them too. But it's an honor to be here. I thank you for your support. I thank you for your love. I'm excited for the future of Norton Christian Church. I'm excited for the future of Manhattan Christian College as we continue to partner together for the gospel. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, everyone. I just want to, let's go ahead and pray over Ben and Manhattan Christian College. And so, Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for Ben and bringing the message to us today and the impact that Manhattan Christian College has on so many students' lives. And I just want to pray for Manhattan Christian College and the ministry it has and the, you know, hundreds and thousands of people who go to that college and are now preachers and teachers and all sorts of just different occupations. And then they just bring God's word into the world. And I just want to thank you for the Norton Christian Church and the support it has for Manhattan Christian College and just the, um, the caring of everyone in this congregation. And just thank you for all the students who have gone there and how it's affected their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. Uh, we are dismissed for Kids Quest, so make sure you guys go to the back and line up, and I'll be right there in a second. I do want to remind you, we do have a fully staffed nursery, if that is something you're interested in. By the way, pay for it or it stays is officially over, so if you have a toilet in your front yard, uh, I did not put it there. So, um, but anyway, uh, throughout this next week, I'm going to be shooting out text messages uh, with balances and and what people owe for that. So, uh, yep, pay for it or stays is officially over. If you have kids and you want them to go to camp, let me know. Uh, we'll get them signed up, and I believe there's an online registration. Uh, we'll walk you through and get you through that. Uh, next, CIY. This is the last week you can sign up. I need you to sign up by the end of March. Uh, the last day of March is uh, Wednesday, and I need that $65 deposit in order to do that. Now, real quick, um, I'm going to share a story with you, and then I'm going to pass this off to Nate. Um, but two men are walking along this fence line, and uh, there's a sign on there that says God's Guideline. And one of the men, he looks back at the other, and he, uh, he says, I I'm tired of this. And he climbs over the fence, and he jumps over. And right before his feet hit the ground, there's a cliff. And the guy yells out that that's not a fence line, that's a guardrail. See, youth group uh, is going to be over for a month. Uh, we're going to take the month of May off. But the last three weeks of April, we're going to do a three-week study on sexual immorality. And we're going to talk about LGBTQ relationships and sex. And this isn't a study to shame anybody. It's not a study to embarrass anybody. It's not a study to call anybody out. But it's a study so we can understand the guardrails that God has in place on these topics. And I wanted to bring this up to the church one, if you're a youth, I encourage you to come. Both junior high and high school will be doing this study. But if you're not, I ask that you just keep us in your prayers. Uh, for me, the sponsors as well as the youth, as uh, everybody in here knows that this is a very predominant issue that's not going to be going away anytime soon. And this is a topic that needs to be covered. So thank you. Um, by the way, April 4th, uh, Easter, we will not be having high school youth group.
Well, it is Missions Madness, and uh, if you notice, uh, Evan has his uh, Manhattan shirt on. He actually went to Manhattan as well, and so Manhattan does have a, play a special role for us. But I told you at the beginning of the month that we had some special news to tell you uh, about some missions that you're going to be able to support. And today we've got two young ladies who are going to come up and present our new mission that we're going to start today from this church. Uh, do you want the video first? So watch the video, pay close attention, and then I want you to be praying about what you can do in your aspect in, in this new ministry. Hi, I'm Amy Ford with Embrace Grace. I'm so excited to be talking to you about your new ministry at your church called Embrace Grace. You have leaders at your church that are completely passionate about helping young moms with unplanned pregnancies, and we are so glad. You are an answer to our prayer because we have needed a church to help in your area. There are a lot of young women with unplanned pregnancies in your area, and when they find out they're pregnant and they really need a place to go to hear about Jesus and to know that there is hope for them, and what we see in Embrace Grace are so many transformations. These girls are getting saved, and they are falling in love with Jesus, and generations are being affected. It's so amazing to watch, and you guys as the church are going to have front row seats to miracles. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the prodigal son and how there's one son that went off and he spent all his dad's money and he made poor choices and he spent his entire inheritance. He decided that he could at least go back home and eat the leftovers from his dad's servants. That was better than the pig food. And he decided to go home and my favorite part of the whole story is that he said, and while he was a long way off, the father ran to him and he had his servants put a robe on his back and a ring on his finger and he said, son, I'm so glad you're home. You were lost and now you're found. And that's what God's love is. You know, a lot of these girls, they are a long way off, but they've turned home and they've turned to their heavenly father and we get to be a part of celebrating with them and be a part of the coming home. It's so amazing to watch. Even if they are a long way off, we're just thankful they have turned to their Heavenly Father so He can do a work in their heart. We can't fix all their problems, but we can point them to the one that does. And we can make sure they know that no single mom walks alone. They will know they are loved and treasured, and we will point them to their Creator and a God that has an amazing plan for their life and their babies. We want them to find their identity and value in Jesus because that's when everything changes. When they get that, like really get it, not just in their head, but in their heart, that's when everything they shouldn't be doing becomes things they just don't wanna do anymore. And you get to see it and be a part of that. This semester, they will have a baby shower and a princess day. And I hope each one of you will pray about how you can come alongside the leaders and be a part of these wonderful events. You can meet them and show them the love of Jesus. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. And I know these moms will see firsthand through each of you God's grace and mercy. So I just wanna thank you and your church for walking alongside these moms. You are not just being pro-life and pro-birth, but you are being pro-whole life and pro-love. You're saying, I'm not just here to help you save your baby, I'm here to help save you too. And I'll love you both, the baby and the mom and the dad, and we're here to walk alongside you through your whole life. And you can be a part of this spiritual family. So thank you guys again. And we're so excited here at the Embrace Grace headquarters to see what God is gonna do in your church. Thank you. Okay, so this is out of my comfort zone. I'd much rather sing to you. But my name is Ashley Katz. I, and this is my co-leader, Carol Sauter. We are excited to be the leaders of the new ministry in our church, Embrace Grace. Both of us have walked through an unplanned pregnancy and know how difficult it can be to find encouragement and support, especially within the church. Whether intended or not, the church is often the place where a mother with an unplanned pregnancy feels the most guilt and shame. We are here to break down those walls and point them to the loving and saving grace of Jesus Christ and walk through them, walk through this challenging time with them. So we're going to shower these young women with kindness, and then we're gonna leave the transformation up to God. And we want these women to know that the church is the first place that they can run to, and not the last. And church, we need your help. So we're gonna be out in the foyer after service, and we'll be available to answer any questions that anyone has 
Uh, and we will also have a list with several ways that everybody can help get involved. And we thank you guys for your love, your support, and most of all, your prayers. Um, we're going to pray over them, but it just hit me uh, a few months ago that Lucas had a wonderful um, meditation about his wife being adopted. And I think it'd be fitting if she would come up and pray over them for us. Sorry, but it's a God thing, so you can't be mad at me. Bob and Lucas and tell him to come there. Okay, Father God, we are so thankful that you are a God of love. We are so thankful for these two women's obedience to step out and bring this ministry and this opportunity to each and every one of us in this church. Father God, we pray that each of us recognize our own role in helping and supporting this ministry. And we, I pray, Father God, if there's someone in this um, congregation today that you're just prompting them, that they'll come forward to these two girls and just um, extend um, their support. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you have adopted each of us into your family. I thank you for this ministry. I pray, pray your blessings over it, and I can't wait to see how you're going to use it in our congregation. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You get to be a part of something great. As we are starting a new ministry here, you get to be a part of that. I want you to put yourself in the place of a young girl who just found out she's pregnant. She's got to tell her mom and her dad. She's got to tell her boyfriend. You put her in a place of hopelessness and loss. And then to know that she'll have a church family that she can run to. And that's you. This whole month, we have been talking about ministries, and we've been talking about ministries that we've been doing overseas, which Manhattan Christian College came here, and I want you to know, I went to St. Louis Christian College, a real Christian college, um, and uh, I always loved it when you looked on the roster, on because I was on the basketball team, and I loved it when we seen Manhattan, I knew I was going to get in the game, that's how bad I was, and that's how, no, we never did play Manhattan, we were afraid to, um, but to think, this, this church has been affected by Manhattan Christian College. Uh, not only did you go, but your mom went as well and has a degree from Manhattan Christian College and a, and a wonderful educator and a, and a wonderful Bible student. We have uh, Daryl Boston, who was a graduate of Manhattan Christian College. But who's going to take their place? Have you ever wondered and thought in yourself, uh, who's going to follow me and who's going to be behind me in what I am doing? Have you, have you ever went out of your way to train somebody to take your place? Uh, I know in, in football, one of the things I love to watch uh, was talking about um, one of the guys in, in college for professional football, his varsity year, his last year, he knew, he said, this is my last year. And he knew who was going to be behind him and who he thought he was. And so he started pouring life into this man and said, you know, next year I won't be the team. I, it will not be on me. It's going to be on you. And so he poured into him what he needs to do. As you look around, and, and many people here today, you know, we've got the, what I call the veterans of spiritual warfare. Men and women who have fought uh, countlessly years. And they're looking around praying that they did a good enough job to hand it off to somebody else. Who's stepping up? We talk and complain about kids these days, and I said that here, I don't know how many different times, and every time I hear it, I hear my dad, Harvey Hagen, voice coming through my mouth, and I'm going, that's got to be like a demon or something, but kids these days, and here's the problem, they're only doing what they've been trained or taught to behave, that's who they are, so you can't blame the next generation, you've got to blame the previous generation for lack of leadership and lack of pouring life into them, and when I was a kid, man, revival was something that you went to. And my generation, as we grew up, didn't like it. So when we got into leadership, we cut it out. Wonder why America is so bad today. Who's stepping up? 
The book of Joshua is a book of the idea of someone else taking over and, and Moses pulls this guy to the side and he is Moses' number one right-hand man. Uh, for 40 years, he has watched Moses' leadership. He's watched him deal with bullheaded and stiff-necked people. He's watched his failures. He's watched his successes. He's watched all this and Moses pulls him to the side and said, uh, my days are numbered and God has chosen you to take my place. Can you imagine whenever Joshua heard that? Can you imagine the, oh, I don't think I can do this. You see, Moses was a reluctant leader, and sometimes reluctant leaders are the best leaders. They look at the, the thing ahead of them, and they're going, boy, I don't know if I can do this. Boy, that's awful big. And Joshua is pulled to the side by God, and, and this theme be strong and courageous, appears throughout the whole book of Joshua. And he not only is told to him, but he tells it to the people. Hey, you need to be strong and courageous. You need to step up. You need to make sure you're ready for this. And don't worry about the battle that have you. God has already given us victory. Be strong and courageous. It's th said three times. God says it three times in Joshua 1, chapter, verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9. There's three different reasons why he tells him to do this. He says, be strong and courageous because there's a cause. You've got to lead your people into the promised land. They need a strong leader to be in front of them. There's a cause. The second reason in verse 7, he says, be strong and courageous because you've got to toe the line. And you've got to know the law and live the law and live the law in front of them. And in order to do that, you've got to be strong and courageous. And then this one, and this one is one that stuck out to me. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous because if you're going to be a leader, there's some dark days ahead. Every day is not a win. Every day is not a victory. And in the book of Joshua, we see that Joshua had some defeats, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But be strong and courageous. When you see in the book of Joshua, one thing you see is that the leaders have to catch a vision in order to cast a vision. And Joshua is sitting there with God, and God's pouring into him, this is what you're going to do, and don't worry about it. There's going to be some dark days ahead, but stay strong and stay courageous. And then I'll need you to be excited on fire for this, because you've got to get all these people behind you to do it. You're going to go into battle with untrained people. Be strong and courageous, because I'm going to win the battle. In the book of Joshua, one of the things we see is that everyone is leading someone. Do you realize, I mean, you're leading somebody. I, I don't care if you're a teenager or, you know, even little kids. You see little kids, they'll grab somebody by the hand and bring them over. Everybody is leading somebody. My question to you is, is your leading noteworthy? Are, are you leading them in the right direction? Are you leading them to be a stronger leader than you were? Are you preparing them to take over your place? And you see, a successful leader, number one, is knowing that he is in touch with God. Before they go anywhere, they drop to their knees. Uh, one of the things that I, that I love about our church is, is our, our elders and deacons. I am very proud of our elders and deacons. I am very honored that they've got my back. And I know that these men, before they make any decision, they get to their knees first. The next thing you see about a successful leader when you're looking through the book of Joshua is the fact that they have to make some tough calls. Eisenhower had to decide whether or not to invade Normandy. He's got generals on one side, and that's a bad idea. The cost is too much. And man, the news media is going to rip us apart. People are not going to like it, and we're going to lose so many people. The generals on the other side said, if you do this, the cost is high, but you could start the end of the war. And it said for, for minutes, seemed like hours, he's walking and pacing, trying to figure out, weigh, weigh the odds. And he finally starts his speech by going, okay, men, this is what we're going to do. 
Right or wrong, he finally had to take a stand. And, and throughout this last year, for a year, we've been dealing with a crisis after a crisis. And, and we have noticed and noted that one crisis has led to another crisis. When we were shut down, the elders got together. I remember the day we prayed about it. All right, we're going to do this. And when we decided to come back together and try some different things, last year around Easter, we decided, let's start out at the lake. And it didn't work out because it was too windy. Well, we'll do the next day. But we've got to get our people together. They need fellowship. They need to be together. And these men were willing to get together and, and, to, and to pray about it. But let me tell you what. <laughs> Making a tough decision is not easy. Because you're going to get criticism. You're going to get fatigued because you're going to stay up late at night trying to figure out what to do for your people. You're going to experience loneliness. And you realize you had to make a tough call, and sometimes you had to make that call, and you're standing alone. If you're going to be the leader, you're going to experience rejection. There are going to be people that are, that are going to pull back because of what you're trying to do. And, and I, I want you to know that I am very proud that they made the decision. And what we've done and how we went forward it is, is our leadership stepping up and saying, we'll take the hit. And that's what they've got to do. They've got to make some tough calls. I don't know, a successful leader has the ability to delegate responsibility. Moses had to get somebody to help him make decisions. His father-in-law come to him and says, boy, you're wore out. Get some other men to make some of these decisions. Joshua had to delegate responsibility. And it was going through and he had to get some people in charge and let some other people do it. Our church, we've got a lot of things going on and it. it looks like there's, there's too much going on too soon, but it's how things timed out. And I think God maybe had a way of, okay, we're going to do this. And it's almost like, like a, a strike. Hit one, hit two, hit three. Boom, boom, boom. Motorcycle Sunday's the end of April. Man, I'm hoping this thing's full of leather. I hope we, you know... They were leather. Okay, you, you had a confused look on your face when I said that. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope this place is full of leather. I hope we have all kinds of people. I hope we have all kinds of long-haired, hippie, hairy dudes. And I hope we have all kinds of people that would never darken the door of a church. I hope they're here that Sunday. And when we've got plans to, to give them some food, we're not doing a potluck or anything, but I'm going to ask some of you, hey, can you help me feed these guys so that they can eat, eat their food and get on their bike and ride? The next week we have cabbage bowl, and I think the elders ought to take on the deacons. That's, that's two teams, and, and I think our families should be able to play. I do too. You know, John, if you could call your other son, get him back for a, a week or two. And I talked to John about that, and he says, my boys can't hit. You want me up there. And we got something for, for the community. Hey, let's get out of our homes. Let's start being community. Let's come down here to the ballpark. Let's have some fun. And when they see us interacting and laughing and having a good time, which never happens at a church softball game, usually there's a fist fight, you know. We've got a lot of things planned, and, and here's the deal. We want to reach the community. We need to reach your family for Jesus. And it's going to take time. It's going to take responsibility. It's going to take all kinds of energy. But that's the way we're going to get them to Jesus Christ. I want to reach my neighbor for Jesus. But it's going to take us working together and, and being successful. And here's the idea that a successful leader has a plan of action. And you look at the book of Joshua. Here's what you see. Seven things that Joshua is willing to do. He assembled the forces. And you can look in Joshua chapter 23. He assembled the forces. He admitted their own weaknesses. Do you realize that the only time that Joshua failed was when he forgot to consult God first? They go into Ai, and they're going to whip Ai. And it, it's an easy battle, and they go in there, and they get defeated. And Joshua throws up his hands, God, you said you'd never leave me. What's going on here? And, and what he says is, there's sin in the camp. You didn't consult me first like you did previously. You didn't go into this battle like the way I told you to go into this battle. And you've got to deal with the sin. I will not let you go any further until you deal with the sin. And that's when you get aching, aching at AI. I only took a little bit. You see that you recount God's victories. Go talk to some of these gray-haired people that have seen God move throughout the years that have seen what God can do, years and years of God's movement, and he can do it again. We just sung the song. You've done it before, and I'm going to know you're going to do it again. It also lets us know that you've got to let the followers know what they need to be doing. 
Do you, do you realize that people come into church and, and they really don't know what it means to be a Christian because we have failed as, as explaining to them what the Christian life is all about? And one thing we need to be doing is explaining this is what it means to be a Christian. The other thing is you tell them what they shouldn't be doing. Call sin, sin. It's sin. If you're accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there needs to be some transformation in your life. And it reminds them of the consequences of poor behavior and poor choices, but it also expresses confidence in them. A good coach, even at a loss, will find something that they can say to their team that's encouraging. And even when they go into a guaranteed loss game and, and everybody, everybody's counting them out, can I be honest with you? I counted us out at Smith Center this year. I did. We didn't have our team from the last year, and all our seniors are graduated. There's, there's just no way. Oh? This is a side note that that's not in my notes, and I want to give you this. When playing poker, you can win with deuce high. It all depends on how you play your cards you're dealt. Every day is a victory if you're willing to play the game right, or willing to play your cards the way you're dealt. And what we got to do is express that we're going to do this. And I am so excited about the new ministry we've got going on. I'm excited about our church. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about where we're headed. I'm excited because I know we've got good leadership who has, who has caught on to a vision and said, this is what we need to do. And I'm excited because the church is getting behind them going, let's go. Let's do this. Let's go win the world for Jesus Christ. And you see... In order to have good leadership, you've got to have people following. If you don't have any following people, people following behind them, and if you're all the time bowling up and stopping all the way through, pretty soon nothing's going to get done. A successful follower is willing to put aside personal interest for the good of the whole community. Selfishness and what I want gets put to the side. We've, we've made some decisions as elders that, Last, over the last year, and I don't know about it, we ended up making the decision, and you know what? They were right. Boy, that's hard for a preacher to say in front of people. Kind of giving me a bad taste. It is always hard for me to say. But for the good of the whole community, a good successful follower is willing to be united under common tasks, and they give us a task, they give us a vision, and we're willing to go with it, go forward with it. But, but here's the problem. In our lives, if you're not careful, your life becomes a circle of living. And it's because you're not being faithful. And, and what you're seeing in the book of Joshua, you see the idea of being able to step outside of our comfort zone and the, and the need to, to do something different. And having faith and stepping out on that faith and doing something in faith is uncomfortable. It's supposed to be. Because it's stretching you and it's growing you. And it also shows us that we need to identify our spiritual cycle in our lives to where we're, hey, we're going back around and doing this again. And you get into the book of Judges. You've got Joshua and then the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, what you see is this pattern. No one to lead them, so they did what they thought was best in their own eyes. God punishes them for it because it's still sin. They send a leader, and they did what was right in their own eyes, and it's just a cycle of continuing to go back and doing the same pattern that they've always done and getting stuck in the same place. They've always gotten stuck. And, you know, churches get that away. You know, church growth, they, they tell you that churches grow like this. You have good high days, and numbers come up, and then you go down. And you have numbers come up, and then you go down. And, and, and usually what happens is, it kind of, you just get a median, and the church for years has always stayed at a certain attendance. We've just been happy, go lucky. But let me tell you what, if we're not putting somebody else, preparing them to lead, that median will go down. The people we're reaching will go down. And even though we've got the highs and the lows, what we should be seeing is this. Even though we've got some bad days, we're going to pick it up. But you see, bondage is when you know you're in sin and you're, you're in slavery and you're subjected to all kinds of things, you feel like you're in prison. But then you start getting faith and you start building your faith up. And as you're building your faith up, it's your confidence. And then you decide to make some commitments. And it takes courage to fulfill those commitments. And courage is the idea that I'm not going to allow fear to dictate my life. And I'm going to just throw fear off and I'm going to do what I know needs to be done. 
Sometimes it's taking the first step down the aisle. That takes courage. But your faith, you know, you've got to put it in Jesus Christ. Because with the courage comes freedom. Do you realize that what Joshua teaches us is God's going to bless us, but the deal is you still got to go fight for it? There's your promised land, now go fight for it. Rahab the harlot, you're going to be free, but you've got to do your part. All the way through the book of Joshua, you get the promised land, but you've got to go claim it yourself and go fight the enemy yourself. But if you're not working on moving forward, all of a sudden you start looking inward and you get selfish about your wants and what you need. And all of a sudden, because of that selfishness, you start getting complacent. And dealing and reading your Bible and going to church kind of gets put on the back burner and what's important to you kind of gets slid to the front and the things that are important aren't getting you anywhere and before you know it, you're back into bondage again. I like what this said. It said this. It says, when you're at the top, stay humble. When you're at the bottom, stay hopeful. But always stay hungry. How do you fix this cycle? Well, you, you get then to the point where you repent. And then after you repent, you're willing to change. Romans chapter 12 says, in view of God's mercies, we need to change the way we think. And changing the way we think is, is called conversion. We've got to convert our mind to think different. And we look at the world different now because we've been converted and we've changed. And our enemy hasn't come up with any new weapons. He still has doubt and he still drags us down the way he's always done. And so I've got to change the way I think about things. Interesting to note, Joshua at the end of his life, he gathers the people together and, and he knows that his days are numbered. And he looks at him and he says, you know, he said, um, you've got a choice to make. You're in the promised land. Now you can go back and worship the gods you just whipped or you worship the God that allowed you to whip them. But it's your choice. Oh, we'll worship God. And he says, no, you won't. And he goes, you choose this day whom you serve. But then he put his foot down, <coughs> drew a line in the sand, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Parents, have you done that yet? Have you drawn a line in the sand and says, nope, that's for me and my house. God comes first. It's sad to note, and one thing I like about the way the, the word goes, you've got the book of Deuteronomy ends, and when Deuteronomy ends, uh, you've got Joshua taking over, then you've got Joshua kind of recounting what happened in, in Deuteronomy, and then you get to the book of Judges, and Judges, the first chapter, recounts what happened in the book of Joshua. And then it says, Joshua died when we went to his ancestors, and then the elders that Joshua led died, and the people didn't have anyone to lead them, so they did what was right in their own eyes. And it's a circular pattern over and over and over again. And the last thing that it said in the book of Judges, the last chapter, the last verse, they had no one to lead them, so they did what was right in their own eyes. We have something to offer, and we need to pass it on. And you can be a part of something big. And there's nothing bigger than knowing that God is using you to spread the gospel message. There's nothing bigger than knowing that you've had a small hand, a small part to play in someone else's salvation. And who knows what they might do in the next generation because of the time you're willing to give to them. Story about a church was having their regular church service and the minister got up before he got up to preach and he kind of held his Bible a little bit and he said, um, there's an old man in the crowd tonight, he's an old retired minister and uh, he was my mentor for so many years. And it would be an honor for me if he'd get up and say a few words. And the old man grabbed his cane and finally made it to his feet, made it up those long mountainous steps. He cleared his throat and he looked over in the corner and there were two teenage boys being teenagers in church. You know what I mean, kind of goofing off. 
And he said, a father took his son and his son's best friend sailing in the Pacific Ocean. And they got out there quite a ways and was having a good time and they didn't realize that a snap storm popped up. And the father was trying his best to get back to the land, but the storm overtook him. It rocked the boat and both the boys fell overboard and the father had to make a decision. As the boat was going further and further away from the two boys, he only had one lifeline. He has to choose who he throws the lifeline to. His son or his son's best friend. And the old man looks over there and now the teenage boys had quit being teenagers and they're actually looking eyeball to eyeball at the old man. And he said the father, knowing his own son was a Christian and saved, he knew that as soon as he took his last breath here, he would step into glory, and I know I'll see him again. But I don't know about his friend. So he decided to take the lifeline and throw it to his son's best friend. At the time he did that, he looked at his son and said, I love you, son. As he pulled as fast as he could, pulled his best friend into, into the boat, and he got ready to throw the lifeline back out, and he looked, and his son was gone. They couldn't even find the body. The old man said, that's what God has done for us. Willing to give up his one and only son so that we could have a lifeline. At the end of the service, the two teenage boys went to the old man as he's in the back shaking hands, and the teenage boys, boy! Man, that's just hard to believe. You know, I know you preachers tell a lot of stories, but man, to tell a story about a, a, somebody throwing a lifeline out and letting his own son die, that's just impossible. That's just, that's just hard to swallow. And the old man looked at him and smiled and said, yeah, yeah, it, it is hard to believe, isn't it? And he shook their hand, and the old man left and went to his car, and the two old boys went up to the preacher and said, man, you told some whoppers in your day. But nothing is hard to believe as that. Preacher, why do you think it's hard to believe? Well, there's no way. It's just impossible. And the preacher said, well, that old preacher was the dad. And I was the best friend. We have something to pass along. You can be part of something big. We're not just saying we're pro-life. We're being life. Who's to say that some mom who's ashamed, some little girl who's ashamed of what happened finds grace here. Decides to keep that baby and no matter what I'm going to try to raise this child. Little snot of a kid, you know. That kid graduates high school and needs somewhere to go to college. And we've encouraged him to go to Manhattan Christian College. Gets his degree, and who's to say that he might be the next one planning a church somewhere? All because we decided to step up and do something great. The greatest thing you could ever do is give your life to Jesus Christ. That's what invitation is all about. They're saying, you know, I'm tired of the fight. I want to do something great. Maybe it's you in that circle and you see yourself in this, in this vicious cycle and maybe you become complacent. And you're saying, you know what? I, I want to get back involved again. I want to do something, anything. Man, to be a part of somebody else's salvation. Knowing you had a hand in them finding Jesus. It's invitation time. Are you willing to put your faith in a powerful God? As we stand and sing today. Let's stand.
his hands, his feet, my Savior of that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Jesus to the entrance here by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise His It's a yeah, suburb of Norton. Yeah. Rieger. Rieger weather warnings. All right. They want to place their membership with us here at Norton Christian Church. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, uh, talked to them here a while back. I got the privilege of baptizing Megan two months ago. 
And she called me one day and said, would you baptize me? I said, not today. I've got a headache. I don't want to do any of that stuff. And, Absolutely. And uh, she said, you know, I've been fighting this and I know it's God fighting me and, and I, I just want to, I want to do it. And uh, Matt's been baptized wet and when he was a teenager some time ago and he knew about that. And that's what, you know, immersed believers. And these three are about as nervous as can be. Now, you guys ready to sing your special? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but they're here. They want to place their membership with us. They said they want to get right involved and get active and we're going to put them busy, put them to work. And that's what we want to do. And uh, so I'm just going to have a prayer for them real quick, and then we'll have communion. Let's do that. Father God, I thank you so much for this family. I thank you, Father, for the smiles on their faces. And, Father, I know that uh, as ranching and farming that, that they get hit a lot, and there's a lot of stress in their lives. But, Father, uh, they worship you. So we pray that you bless them and bless their work that they're doing, but also bless them here at the church. And, Father, may they feel that it, it's family, it's home. And may they get active and get involved, and may they see that uh, their work in the church is vital and crucial to the furthering of the kingdom. Thank you, Father, for the decision to be part of us, and may you bless this relationship. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. You, are, you may be seated. All right, you may be seated for communion. Oh. Good morning. Move that over there. Can you still see me? Okay, just checking. What a morning. Man. I get a daily devotion in my email, and I received one a few days ago that I thought would fit pretty good with the situation in our world right now and a communion meditation. So I'm just going to read it to you all. The guy says, I've never been in a major earthquake. Well, I mean, except the, for the pandemic. Seems like it's shaken about everyone and everything. One thing earthquakes do, they reveal the buildings that weren't built strong enough to, to stand the shock. Just like floods revealed the weaknesses in a levee or a dam or a flood wall that ha wasn't built high enough. This pandemic thing's gone on so long that there are cracks starting to show. In marriages, families, in churches, in our mental and physical health, Researcher George Barna released a disturbing report on, a, on the damage of COVID has done to our human connections. He said that over half the U.S. adults say they're struggling with at least one re relational or emotional mental health issue, something that impacts their most important relationships, anxiety, depression, loneliness. They're always hard, just harder in recent months. Many times the quake or storm doesn't necessarily cause the damage, it exposes it. That weak spot, that conflict, that hidden pain has probably been there for a while, unacknowledged, unaddressed, until everything starts shaking. Suddenly that crack becomes a gaping, even dangerous hole. Things that have been lurking in the dark suddenly can't be hidden any longer. <clears throat> Ticking time bombs, like ungrieved grief, unsolved, unresolved conflict, unforgiven hurts, unconfronted sin, things we've stuffed rather than deal with, hidden, thinking no one will know, denied, hoping it will go away. One thing they all have in common, a fear of facing inconvenient truth and reluctance to change. Strangely, like fictional vampires, brokenness grows and thrives in the dark. But I find a hopeful prescription in an oft-quoted statement of Jesus. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He doesn't say the truth will hurt you more or ruin your life. Facing the truth will set you free from the chronic pain and shame of avoiding the truth. All the pandemic shaking has made our broken places harder to hide. Like like the damage our anger, our searing words do, the dark passions we've entertained, the wounds we've inflicted, the scars we hide, the bitterness we've harbored, the walls we've built. I may not like the truth an x-ray or a CAT scan or a blood test reveals, but it's the first step to healing. I've been confronted by some liberating words from the Bible. It begins with, God is light, and in, in him, there's no darkness at all. So it says, if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have the fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I got to thinking, the things that cause brokenness in our relationship are often things we harbor in the dark. The wounds that cause us to to hurt others or ourselves, they ultimately overwhelm us. Those are hurts that we've kept stuffed in the closet. And the reason we feel far from God, just when we need him the most, might be sin secrets that we conceal in the dark. But restoring a relationship with each other or with our creator begins when we drag our junk out of the closet and into the light, where there is no darkness at all. The vampire of of my buried darkness starts to shrivel in the light when I get the long avoided issues out in the open. Listen, if the pandemic has revealed a crack, a hole, a wound, a need, then this curse could turn it out to bring a a blessing, letting the light into the darkness that has crippled us for so long. And there, just outside that dark closet, stands Jesus, wanting to walk walk through all the brokenness with you. He knows about broken. He was for you on the cross. The Bible says, He took up our pain and the punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And when I... And I love this part, it says, and by his wounds we are healed. So as we come to this table today, we take our bread, and we're mindful of that sacrifice, and we take the bread, and it represents the body that was broken. And then the cup represents his blood that was poured out for us. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we we thank you for a wonderful, wonderful day with all the friends that showed up, Lord, and wonderful worship. Great message from Nate, Lord, and we just come to you now as we remember the sacrifice your son made for us, Lord, and we just thank you for that. God, forgive us of all our sins. Lead, guide, and direct us to do your will. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's have an offering prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together in fellowship with other believers. And I thank you for MCC and uh, through their ministry, uh, leading others to, to Christ. And, and uh, just the, the many blessings that you pour out on them and us. And I just thank you for our partnership with them and many other colleges throughout the country. That uh, we just are, are light to others and we show others the, the love that you've shown us. And I thank you for, for this time together and uh, just be with the gift and the giver and just uh, help us to give graciously to further your kingdom. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. We have a few announcements. Don't forget to sign the petition for the Armenian genocide. Uh, they're trying to get the government to look at Christians that are dying in Armenia. It's just sign that. It's, it's out there on the thing to sign it for up for that. My Story, His Glory is going to be this Wednesday at uh, 7 o'clock, and it's going to be Jane Rogers, the one that did the signing last week. Uh, Good Friday service is going to be here at noon this Friday, if you can. A lunch will be provided down in the fellowship hall. Make sure you do that. Uh, communion, next week we're going back old school. All right. Some of you are fighting the communion, weren't you? Yeah, did you win or lose? So yeah, just sip on it a while. Take Jesus a little bit at a time. That's okay. Um, but uh, next week, we're going to offer both. If you want the, the single individual cup, because you want that, we're going to have that back there. But also, we're going to start passing communion out uh, the, the way God intended it, you know. This weekend is the Haven's Garage Sale. I'm not supposed to say that, but it is this weekend, this Saturday. All right. Um, Easter Sunday is celebrating next week. 
And please come next week. You're going to, uh, some things are going to be a little different. You're going to enjoy it next week. Uh, don't forget, elders, we have a meeting April 7th at 8.15. Board meeting is the 11th at 1 o'clock. And the elders' prayer meeting is the 21st at 6.45. What do we have if we have a board meeting? Uh, what do we have if we have a board meeting? You guys sound like it's dredging or something. It's going to be awesome. Potluck, the same uh, now on the 11th. Also, uh, Motorcycle Sunday, April 25th, we are going to ask them to call in to let us know how many bikers we're going to have. And like I said, I want a church full of leather, and then we're going to feed them so that they can get on their bikes and ride. Uh, we're going to have things a little different that week as well. There is going to be a blessing of the bikers by the CMA that are going to be here. It's going to be awesome. So be part of that. Also, cabbage ball. We're going to start a tradition here, and what it is, it's an oversized softball that you hit with a baseball bat. You don't need a glove for it. You will, Tyson, because you're just, you know, your dad said you need all the help you can get. Um, but we want you to sign up teams, call in, and say that you have a team that you're willing to play. I, I went over to the grade school and asked them to get a team together, and they said as long as Angie will play, they'll play. Uh, and then, uh, um, uh, and also the high school and junior high, but also get a team together, call the church, say I've got 10, 10 willing to play. And I do think the elders will take on the deacons. They think they're better than us. It's just, you know what I mean? You know, <coughs> I've got to... All right. Andy Avery is going to be here May 8th. Many of you remember him. Free concert at East Campus. I invite people to the concert. Also, uh, that Sunday, Mother's Day, he's going to be leading us in worship uh, as well. All right. I'm done. Boy, wasn't that a good day? Wasn't that a good day? All right. Let's stand and sing out of here. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise God. Good week, everybody.